Do you think we should get started, Zayla? We have a little over 50 participants. Great. Well, let's get out of respect for people's time. Why don't we get, we'll get going. So uh, welcome to the uh, webinar hosted by Catholic Investment Services. Thank you for joining us today. Our topic is whether enhanced board governance makes a difference in investment returns. This program is the third in a series about governance best practices for Catholic institutions. My name is Tom Langto, and I am privileged to serve as Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Investment Services. My colleague Zayla Astarjian has done a great job organizing this program and is at the Zoom controls. Enormous thanks to our accomplished panel, who you'll meet shortly. Today's format will be conversational, and I will moderate. I always like it better when someone else does the work, but I'm happy to moderate today. Uh, there will be time for audience questions after the formal part of the program, so please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen to submit a question. Our audience is muted. The program is being recorded and will be available for replay on the webpage of our CIS Institute. Catholic Investment Services was founded by some of the investment industry's most respected leaders to address the investment challenges faced by Catholic organizations. We are a Catholic nonprofit serving other Catholic nonprofits and now manage almost $1 billion of client assets in four different strategies. We hope that this program provides you with some useful take home value. You all receive biographical information for our speakers and Zayla is gonna sh share that now, but I wanna offer a few highlights. We have a sophisticated audience today, and I think you will agree that our panel is more than equal to the task. Like his fellow panelist, Paul Stevens, Chris Merker began his career as a public servant in what must have been a fun role as assistant to the US ambassador to Ireland. After experiences as a public affairs consultant in Washington, DC, Chris earned his MBA and caught the investment bug. A serious overachiever, Chris is both a CFA charter holder and earned his PhD from Marquette University, where he spent four years researching the impact of governance on investment performance. Chris is not only a serious academic, but a successful practitioner through his work at Robert W. Baird, where he advises Catholic institutions among other clients. Paul Stevens, first and foremost, is a trustee of Catholic Investment Services, but as importantly served for many years as the investment committee chair for the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, and continues to serve as a fiduciary for several other noteworthy Catholic institutions. Before his distinguished career as chief executive officer of the Investment Company Institute and in private law practice, Paul served in senior positions at the White House and Department of Defense during the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations and received the Department of Defense's highest civilian honor. Now, before we start our conversation, I hope you'll please join me in a short prayer. And this is a prayer that I've borrowed from Paul many times. Dear God, please grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Please specially bless all those whose lives have been so disrupted by the pandemic and help those of us who have merely been inconvenienced realize how lucky we are. Amen. Well, thanks again to our exceptional panel and let's get going. Chris, you've done some really remarkable research on uh, governance and investment performance. And as I mentioned, uh, you're a serious academic, but you are also a successful practitioner. So in plain English for our, uh, 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 we'll call it lay audience, could you give us a, uh, some brief background on, 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 your, on, the, on the research and why it's so important? Yeah, absolutely, Tom, and, and thank you so much for having me here today. It's a, it's a real honor to speak with you in this in this audience. Um, so I've been a practitioner, as you mentioned, for for several years at uh, Baird, working with organizations and uh, boards and investment committees. And just over that time, you know, we've seen a range of behavior and uh, stories and change uh, with organizations as their uh, as organizations have evolved and developed and. When I started teaching at Marquette University uh, in 2009, I was teaching corporate governance. And I started to think about how corporate governance might be applied to the field of asset owner governance. And specifically, I had questions about how behaviors would start, were, were affecting the, the performance of, of 
organizations. And so that's really where, where it started. And I was fortunate enough to get to know Dr. Sarah Pack, who was chair of the finance department, uh, who had served as chair of the Milwaukee uh, pension system. Uh, and she was on the chair of the investment committee and she you know, had 20 plus years in corporate governance research. And I said, you know, I, I think there's very little empirical research in this field that would be rife for uh, a topic. And I was thinking about a, a PhD program at that point in time with, with Marquette. And this really was the, the inception of that idea. And so she got it right away. And uh, this really kind of began what, what's been a, a great partnership uh, at Marquette uh, and uh, of course our, our work here at Baird. So um, really excited to share a lot of what we've found today with you. So in your book, The Trustee Governance Guide, which I should add is, is available on Amazon. Uh, and Chris, we've already identified one conflict of interest today because you mentioned that you are selling your own book to your students. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but, but, we, but we can we cleanse, we dis, full disclosure cleanses most conflicts. So we've we've done that. But uh, but in your book, which is which is terrific, you identify the five imperatives of 21st century investing, and I'm I'm going to re, re, I'm going to recite them, and then we're going to uh, uh, do a deep dive on each one of them. Uh, first one is be well governed. Next is be knowledgeable. Next is be diversified. Next is be disciplined. And finally is to be impactful. And these are easy concepts to uh, articulate. I think they're hard to execute. So I'm, I'm very interested in the perspectives that Paul and you have on, on uh, all of these topics. Um, let's start with be well governed. Uh, and Zayla, maybe, yeah, thank you. Uh, so normally we don't, uh, uh, it's normally a CIS practice uh, not to show slides during the, uh, the conversation that we have with our, our panelists, but today uh, Chris has really got some pretty powerful slides. So we're gonna feature just a few as we go through our, our, our conversation. So be well governed. Yeah, uh, 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 Chris and Paul, the punchline may, may seem obvious here. It, it, it may be, you know, again, easy to say, does good governance uh, have an effect on performance? Most people would say, well, of course it does. But, but, but Chris, you've actually got some, met you've actually put some metrics to this uh, to, to prove it and to demonstrate where, where some folks have come up short. So you talk about that for a minute. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, we were honored to have Keith Ambachir uh, write the opening of the book. I appreciate you mentioning the book. Um, he uh, is really, to my mind, it was a real honor when Keith agreed to, to write the, uh, the intro, because uh, I view him as sort of the, the, the godfather of the field. Uh, so his, his initial work starting 20 years ago, uh, he recognized it. Uh, today, he's probably one of the best known voices, certainly in the area of uh, pension governance. And uh, a lot of the, the initial work that Keith and others did really focused on survey data, uh, which is, I, I think, a good approach. You know, one of the challenges when you're dealing with governance information is you're, you're dealing with something that's hard to quantify. Um, and so that, that was really the initial approach for probably, you know, call it two decades. Um, now, what's happened in the area of corporate governance is a lot of these things have been quantified. And we've seen a, a whole industry crop up around that with, you know, the likes of ISS and so forth and proxy voting. And, um, and so today in the area of corporate governance, there's been a huge amount of work that's been done over that past 20 years, specific to corporations and their boards uh, that has quantified the impacts of, of governance uh, on things like stock returns. So we, we weren't really, when, when Sarah Peck and I approached this research, we weren't really breaking new ground so much as we were applying it in, in a new and what I think is a very interesting way of trying to figure out what quantification governance could have with uh, organizational outcomes, specifically investment returns, but not, not just investment returns, looking at other financial outcomes. So that's, that's really how we approach that. And uh, you, you've kindly shown some of the, the, the sort of punchline of our research. And, you, you know, it, it took, uh, uh, it, you know, cadres of graduate students over, over five years to, <laughs> to collect this information, because when, when you're dealing with new data, you have to actually create the data. There was no governance data set when we first started this project. Uh, we had to hand collect it. And we selected public pensions as our initial uh, study group because, or, or focus for the study, because they actually produce information. They don't do it all in the same way. 
Uh, they don't do it consistently, certainly, uh, but they do produce meeting minutes. They produce other public disclosures. Uh, and so we were at least able to go to a raw data source and collect that information and start to uh, look at some of that uh, uh, data and analyze it. So what we, what we started with was 160 public pensions. And eventually we got that down to a Pierce data set of 45 public plans. Now that represented somewhere around 15 to 20% of the total asset universe in the United States. So we, we had what you would call a statistically significant sample. And from that, we were able to analyze a lot of data. Okay, we started with, because we didn't know what ultimately matters. We, we looked at, I think, initially 42 governance factors. Uh, we looked at investment returns. We looked at funding ratios. We looked at uh, required contribution, a whole variety of financial metrics. And from that, we were able to glean and narrow it down. The best way I can describe it, I won't get into the statistics, but every data point has meaningful information if it's relevant. And so how do you capture and how do you reduce that data set to something that you can actually work with? And so I, I, I probably best describe it as, let's say I handed you War and Peace, okay? It's a long book, I read it once. It's over a thousand pages. And I said, okay, now I want you to tell me what this book means in a minute, <laughs> okay? So what, what, what our approach did, our statistical method did was take that entire book and reduce it down to a single page, all right? And from each chapter in that book, we picked up various pieces of statistical information, relevant data that ultimately formed that final FEQ, which is what you see here on the, on the chart, the FEQ score, which is a corporate governance uh, measure uh, so it's sort of an overall uh, measure or score to the organization. And within that, there are key, key drivers, all right? And the key drivers of that include some things that'll be recognizable to anyone who's read anything about uh, governance. This can be things like board composition, professionalism, engagement, uh, the role of the staff and consultant. Yeah, you're flipping the next page where they're all listed. The, the institutional knowledge within that organization, the, their diligence in, in how they uh, deal uh, as a board or an organization, and then how transparent the organization is. So all those factors, when, when you boil it all down, end up with something that we can measure in the form of the FEQ. And so if you go back to that prior slide, and, and this is where we, we tied out our statistics because you know at the end of the day, correlation is not necessarily causality, but we did find enough here to suggest that we had something very meaningful. And so what we found that FEQ score was explanatory of investment returns of uh, uh, around 78%. And when we looked at other financial metrics, it was as high as 95%. And when we broke it down by quintile from best performing organizations to the worst performing, at, at least from a governance metric scoring basis, what you found is you found a very interesting lineup of financial outcomes. So these are five-year average returns. Uh, and it was, uh, was a very strong, strong relationship that, that was demonstrated. And lastly, and, and very importantly, is there was a lag relationship. So from the time that you see a governance metric, uh, when you take a measure, to the time you see the investment result, uh, pretty much across the board, that was on a 12-month basis. So about a one-year relationship between governance variables and uh, the dependent financial outcomes. But Chris, you know what strikes me about this graph is that um, the fifth, the lowest quintile, the difference in five-year performance, and I guess this is on an annual basis, uh, is considerably more than 300 basis points. Uh, yeah, it's correctly. That's that's quite a that's quite a delta in in terms of performance. It, it's two times. Uh, it's two times between first and, and fifth quintile. And for, for anyone who's you know spent time, especially in the in the, the pension world with liability driven investing, uh, the difference of a of a hundred basis points can can be the difference between being funded and being underfunded. Uh, so you're you're right to point that out, Paul. That, that was a huge huge difference. And what we found on average is if if a if an organization could boost its FEQ score even just ten points. Uh, they would be able to drive 
a significant amount of change in their in their uh, investment return performance. So the the statement here in the study, over sixty percent of organizations performed below the average, and the average wasn't very good. That's awfully damning. So there's a lot of it, money being yeah. left on the table as a result of really not focusing on making sure that your organization is well governed. Yeah, yeah, that that was that was true. Go ahead, Tom. No, no, go ahead. No, what, what I was going to say is, uh, you, you saw uh, like like you would expect a, a fair amount of, of skewness in the data. So you had you know a, a fair number of organizations that performed exceptional, uh, and then you had some that performed really not very well at all. And then you had this kind of group in the middle. And what what I expected is that we would see a, a something more bell shaped. Uh, and what we didn't is what we saw was something much, much uh, more skewed to the bottom. Uh, and so, you know, if we look at governance scores and, it, you know, we, we index this from one to 100, on average, you see a governance score of about 20. Um, so it, it, it shows you how downwardly skewed the data is just on your point. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if an organization wanted to focus on this and improve its governance game, so to speak, how, how quickly would you expect to see that in improved performance? Well, it, it, across the board, we, we saw consistently, because we, we didn't know the, the sort of uh, amount of lag that might be involved in, in driving that change. And, and so we looked at the data in terms of, you know, is it, is it immediate? Is it a six month lag? Is it a two year lag? Uh, when, when does that start to sort of kick in? if you will. And that, that's where I, I mentioned it, it was literally 12 months. It didn't matter what the variable was you were looking at, as long as it was statistically meaningful and relevant to the FPQ. Uh, in general, it takes about 12 months. And so you, you think about that and how a governance function plays out and processes there with, and you get a fair amount of things that happen in any given year to any organization. I mean, forget about what happens exo exogenously, like with COVID, right? Where, I mean, oh my God, world's upside down suddenly. Um, just internal to the organization, you know, board turnover, uh, changes in circumstances of the organization, uh, things that can be going suddenly very well uh, or be, be, you know, challenging. You can have macroeconomic trends that, that may be affecting, you know, there's been a uh, sort of a, a dearth for uh, speaking about college endowments. There's been a population dip recently, which has affected organizations. So any number of those factors can play out over the course of a year and how the, the, the organization responds from a governance perspective, you start to play, see play out in the data with those, with those decisions. And, and what's interesting is I've had organizations say, well, we're expecting, you know, because we're going through a, a study right now, we're, we're expecting a fair amount of change in the next few months. Should we be responding to the survey? And I, I say, of course, yes, always. There's always change. So th this is something that you need to be looking at on an annual basis because of that. Uh, and so I think that's, that's a very important question you're asking. Chris, you know, the, 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 the part of the slide that talks about boards consistently coming up short and there, there are various bullet observations there. Uh, some of these are surprising to me. Um, I would have expected, for example, that uh, the frequency uh, um, of, of meetings would be fairly predictable. I mean, certainly if you're looking at investment returns, the minimum would be on a quarterly basis, I would guess. Um, um, uh, that, that's, it surprises me that, that the frequency of board meetings is, is a problem. Are others of these results here surprising to you in that way? Well, th this is uh, based on s survey responses, not, not from us, not from me, uh, but from other surveys that have been conducted. And that's been one of the sort of comments. And I think what it relates to is the amount of work that's being imposed on boards and committees o over, the, over the course of time. And so, uh, and it really depends on the type of organization. I mean, you find uh, with, with, with foundations and endowments, they tend to meet more quarterly uh, versus uh, pensions that tend to meet more on a, and not quite every month, but I would say, you know, every, every other month. Mm -hmm. So it, it depends on the kind of organization, but it also depends on the kind of work they're being, they're, they're being asked to do. And uh, invariably what happens is you see that boards are, are trying to, to jam a lot of 
agenda items through. And so where they see their role, and I think this is partly explains the, the, the significant trend we've seen over the last few years of OCIO, uh, is you're seeing this, this effort to try to outsource these functions because they just don't have the bandwidth. And then when you add on to that, the, the numerous issues that organizations are contending with, especially in the current environment, and then you couple that with the additional layer of responsibility that's being imposed from more sustainability imperatives, which we'll get to, I know, uh, you've now got a situation where, where they're, they're frankly, you know, just trying to keep their head, heads above water uh, with, the, with the time that they can spend. Well, and the investment environment has not been exactly stable over, over recent years with the Great Recession and then what happened with, with COVID and, and the like. Um, you, you have uh, developed, I think, a, um, um, a, a committee self-assessment checklist, have you not, Chris? Yeah, so we, we've actually partnered with uh, uh, just a, a wonderful thinker on governance, uh, Mel Gill from Canada. He, he's, he's not very well known here in the US, but he's very well known in Canada, uh, especially in the nonprofit sector for a system that he developed in the, in the early 2000s. And he, he wrote a book, it's an outstanding book uh, on, on governance uh, that um, I, I came across in the, in the matter of just my own research. And uh, when, when we were developing the FEQ and realized that we had something from the, from the board structure point of view, uh, I had reached out to Mel and said, I, I think you have a fantastic process instrument uh, and I would like to license it for our system. And he said, uh, I'm sorry, who are you again? <laughs> um, so, uh, but it was great timing because uh, I think Mel is getting up in years and he was becoming less active. And, and so he was very generous in basically saying, here, you take it. Uh, we put it into uh, a, a fantastic new sort of modern and updated uh, IT context and application online. Um, and uh, it, yes, it, it's, uh, it's a very powerful tool for uh, helping the board go through a self-assessment exercise. It's uh, fully online. It, in, it involves the, um, uh, the staff, so senior staff members, the uh, senior executive, uh, as well as the, the, the members of the board. And uh, they are able to, it, it scores a fair number of items. We have, there's a shorter version, sort of immediate checklist in the, in the uh, questions you're showing here from that uh, quick check. Uh, but there's a much larger set of items. And I would say one of the best advantages, and this is true for any board self-assessment, by the way, and this is not the only, uh, only instruments really out there, um, is just the, the amount of communication that it, it, that it uh, incites uh, and, and, and issues that it surfaces. Because especially for newer board members, they may not be as familiar and might not know what issues are front and center. And for those who've been around for a long time, they may not feel comfortable um, bringing up certain issues. And so that's where I think the self-assessment act, uh, activity can be so, so uh, powerful for, for organizations. You know, I associate the inception of this sort of self-assessment process with the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation that was passed, oh, quite some years ago now in the corporate and the, and, and the fund context. Um, uh, Self-assessment, I think, has now become um, an, an, essential, an essential tool. Um, how often do you think a self-assessment needs to take place? I believe under Sarbanes-Oxley, it's almost an annual affair. Yeah, and that, that you're quite right. For, for corporate boards, and I believe also fund companies, uh, they have to go through that. The, um, so for nonprofits, I, I would recommend it uh, once a year. I think uh, two years is probably fine. Uh, I, and I, I think the main reason is that you see, and, and I've gone through a number of these with organizations, some of my own clients, and the, um, the reason why you wanna do it once a year is because you do have people turning over. Uh, that's that's a, 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 me, a very important metric we look at actually in, our, in, the, in the FEQ. Uh, so you, you really do sort of need it to, to keep tabs on, on the organization, orient new board members. So uh, yeah, one year, once a year is definitely recommended. All right, well, let's talk about being knowledgeable. Aha, the second imperative. 
So uh, this this is a second imperative in the in the book, and it's an important governance matter. On um, oh, uh, I'm sorry, we're we're we were jumping ahead to be knowledgeable, but we can stick on this one for a little bit longer if you like. Um, no, let's go to the one that was there before Zella, with the 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 round diagram, the circles. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, th this is uh, an important governance issue which deals with trustee competency. And, um, you know, th th of course there's the broader related issue which is a, a personal passion of mine. And uh, we, we have some wonderful organizations here in Wisconsin, namely Secure Futures uh, and the Wisconsin Financial Literacy Foundation. But um, financial literacy uh, is, is, a, is an important board competency and so the, the question that we, we try to get at in, in the book and uh, keep, you know, kept coming up in our research was the role of that. And I think this all fits into uh, a point that uh, Ambachir makes at the beginning, which is to say that you know, the rise of behavioral finance and our understanding of behavioral finance and all the deficiencies that we as uh, human decision makers are, are, are dealing with, uh, the, the antidote really is is literacy, financial literacy or education. Uh, and so this gets all into the issues of board training and, and things like that and, and understanding the role of the fiduciary. And so we, we asked the question uh, in, the, in the book and, and, and during the research, well, how much is enough, right? How much do we really need to know? Does everybody need to be an expert in small cap, for example? <laughs> no. Uh, so. So that's, that's where we came up with this three ring concept. And I would say we start out with that outer ring, which is to say that, you know, everybody, including trustees, and, and oh, by the way, I mean, this is, this is why this is especially important. You think about the fact, and I, I neglected to mention this at the outset, when we talk in this country about people who are responsible for acting as a fiduciary and overseeing the financial assets of the United States, it's a small percentage. I mean, and we're talking maybe less than 2% of the population who fulfill that role as a, as a trustee or fiduciary. And so that, that's putting a lot of responsibility on a person and relying on them to have a level of knowledge to execute that duty um, that, you know, you as the beneficiary who may or may not ever interact with that person have no uh, uh, knowledge or awareness as to where, where they stand. And so when you look at the, the range of asset owner organizations, I mean, they're, they're uh, being, uh, you know, staffed by people. And, and by that, I mean, people on the board uh, from all walks of life. They're not accountants. They're not investment managers. They're not, certainly not all of them. Many of them are, but not all of them. And so what, what can we expect from them uh, in terms of being able to perform those duties? And so that's where we start with the financial liter literate, which I think you know everybody, most most everyone in this audience is going to is going to know what that means. And then you bring it up to the level of competency, which I you know we factored in two more things, and this is based on academic research, by the way. It was a very good study out of the UK a few years ago, uh, talking about this. And part of it is just having an understanding of probability theory. Um, so that that's an element that comes into play, understanding the role of a fiduciary, understanding how to address conflicts. That's, that's another uh, key part of this. And then there's that final inner circle, uh, which is where we talk about the professional or expert. And that's, you know, that, that's obviously a lot of people who are on, on this call today. And no one expects a trustee to, to, to necessarily uh, be at that level. I remember very clearly when the, the Bishop of our diocese had asked me to join the finance council and, and uh, to lead the investment committee. I told him, I said, I'm not an investment expert but I certainly am very well aware of what a good fiduciary process looks like. And, and I found that to be uh, at least as important as understanding the, the technicalities of, the, of the, the way that the portfolios were constructed, um, particularly if you're trying to lead the committee. Um, um, so, I mean, I think you gain that kind of confidence in a different way perhaps than you do investment knowledge um, because it really is being involved with these kinds of structures professionally. Of course, my background was as a lawyer. Um, um, but I, 
Uh, the only thing I would say about this graph is that that fiduciary duty probably, in my view at least, needs to be emphasized even more. Mm -hmm. um, and most committees can get the professional expertise that they want um, from, some, from some source outside the board itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, that, and that's where I think many are. Uh, and, and so, I, and, and we talk about that in terms of, you know, different levels of a fiduciary uh, and the one thing that they can't do, and I think this is an important point as well, and it sort of fits in with what you're saying about emphasizing fiduciary duty is they can't outsource that. So, you know, and oftentimes I, I've been asked, well, you know, our board isn't that involved in our investment. Should we have our, should we have the board respond? And I said, of course you should. The board is the fiduciary. They can't ask, they can ask a committee for help. They can ask uh, for outside, uh, uh, you know, suppliers, advisors, investment managers, actuaries, but they cannot outsource that duty and they need to maintain some degree of oversight. Right. So a very, very yeah. important concept. Yeah. You know, the second part it's of what- It's indefeasible. Oh, oh, go ahead, Paul. Yeah. What's that? It's indefeasible. I just went through this process with an investment policy statement I've been working on with a, a foundation here in Northern Virginia. And um, um, we talked about the role of the consultant, but I made it very clear in drafting the document that the oversight, the responsibility and accountability at the end of the day has to be on the committee and on the board. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, the, the second part of how I think about this being knowledgeable is you know, one of the things that I would, you know, struggle, we were talking about how Daniel Kahneman, uh, the, the, the very well-known Nobel laureate, you know, winning professor who basically developed the field of behavioral finance, um, and behavioral economics, he's got a new book out. And one of the things that I struggled early on in my career was really understanding how to apply behavioral uh, finance concepts or principles to, to everyday work or life. And I think what, with all this work we've done in the area of governance research, that we found that this is actually the area where it resides best, right? Because you look at this list on the bottom of common committee errors, this is all behavioral finance, heuristics and biases, everything we're seeing right here. Um, and all of us suffer from it. And those of us who, I, I was reading the other day a study that you know uh, smart people apparently are, are most prone <laughs> because they suffer from uh, uh, overconfidence uh, bias and, or you know, self uh, um, you know, co uh, uh, confirmation bias. And uh, no one would probably argue that a lot of the, the folks in our field are, don't consider themselves to be above average of intelligence. Um, so anyway, but you look at the list here and this, these are very common committee er errors that, that happen. And uh, you know, we're gonna look at a slide here in a minute on diversification, uh, which I think really speaks to that. Some of the, some of the behaviors we're seeing in the markets these days. Oh but yeah, slow, great. Slow down Zayla, let's go back. Let's, we're not done with the, the prior slide here because I, I think these are really these are really important uh, and Paul I'd be interested in your view on on the well the lack of an investment policy statement means that you do not have a governance framework available to guide what the committee's doing uh, and you don't have sort of an approved approach to your investments um, uh, that the board has endorsed um, um, or should re-endorse actually on a on an ongoing basis um, uh, working with a conflicted advisor is far too often a a problem in, in, from my observation. Um, uh, um, dysfunctional committees, well, we're all human, I suppose, so that's gonna be something. But it, it leads me to the question, Chris, of whether, um, you know, in addition to self-assessment, whether peer review is something that's characteristic of strong and productive uh, boards and committees. Have you looked at that issue? Yeah, we, we have. And uh, we've actually talked about because, of course, that's the direction uh, that corporate governance has gone. Uh, and in fact, you know, you, you made the comment a, a little while ago about uh, Sarbanes-Oxley requirements. And uh, since I think 2004, every public publicly listed company has to file a corporate governance self-assessment or board self-assessment. Uh, and today, I think the numbers are pretty striking. It's about half of all public companies now go through a, a, a peer review, or you know, as you said, peer review uh, or board member uh, review. So uh, yeah, I we we haven't gone, we haven't taken that step uh, of going that far down to the individual 
level. And when we've talked with organizations, though, we have said, because I've gotten the question before, you know, should we be assessing ourselves? And I said, well, you should. And while we don't have a formal instrument, what I think, what I've encouraged organizations to do on that is to, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, we think of getting a grade in school, right? Where, you know, did you, did you pass or fail your class? This is more of having one-on-ones uh, with perhaps the, the chair uh, or one of the, one of the committee leads and, and having more one-on-one conversations, maybe looking at the board assessment to present more individual views uh, and receive feedback. And so uh, I, I totally agree. I think there's, uh, there's a real great role for, for that here. All right, well, now let's jump ahead to, I think, which is one of your best slides, the diversification slide. So, Yeah, so uh, th this is a little bit more updated, of course. Uh, I think we, uh, uh, our group put the slide together just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it is interesting. So in the book, we talk about be diversified. Well, you know, okay, be diversified. We've known that since, uh, since the 50s, um, if not way, way before that. And so, uh, you know, there, there was no, 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 nothing new under the sun there. But the reason why we, we put it under the list of imperatives is because it, it's, it's a pretty, pretty important one out there. And, I, and it still remains very, very important, especially when you look at all the investment options today. And, you know, we, we said in the book, you know, the, the, the risk isn't so much of being diversified to today. It's, it's maybe being over diversified or being overexposed to areas when you think you're diversified. And the hundreds of thousands of investments and securities and products and funds and commingled and you know yada, 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 the list goes on and on and on. And today with the emerging classes and we list some of them here on the slide. And I think this was you know, a, a great year to be sort of uh, revisiting these, these very essential lessons, which is, you know, tried and true is okay. We don't we don't need to go after the bright shiny objects. And what you're looking at here on this on this chart is uh, we're showing, of course, uh, Bitcoin, and uh, which uh, you know had another significant down track uh, last last week. Uh, it's been, of course, on the on the decline since it peaked in April. Uh, and we've also seen things like meme stocks uh, on and on throughout the year, the SPACs. And, you know, throughout the year, especially with valuations where they're back at, you know, you, you've definitely seen a, a, a fair amount of FOMO going on in the, in the market. And, uh, you know, this slide, I think, was just to remind people, hey, um, you know, that, that old 60-40, that, that old stodgy 60-40 portfolio, you, you, you sort of uh, keep hearing that uh, is, is, is outdated and was your, your, your grandpa's uh, type of investment vehicle. Uh, that's actually been a pretty good place to be this year. And uh, all these bright, shiny objects have, have really not delivered. And so I think that's, you know, people say, well, this is more, this is all retail investors. No, no, not necessarily. We're, we're hearing about it from, from other quarters too. And, and, and that's you know, why I think this is Chris, a great I, I thing to revisit. One of my favorite books of, um, uh, in, in this area is uh, McKay's Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Uh, which goes through the Tulipo mania and, and the uh, um, the South Sea bubble and the Mississippi bubble and all the rest of it. Um, me, these may not be quite as dramatic as some of those episodes, um, but um, I, I think there's there's a deep wisdom here about when everyone is excited about something, say cryptocurrency, to look upon it with a bit of skepticism um, uh, and wonder what its long-term value and prospects are. That's particularly true, it seems to me, if your role is governance of a pension fund or, uh, or, or something of that sort, which is a store of value that's intended to cover very, very long-term needs um, and upon which people are gonna depend so critically. There's really no short, shortcut, is there, to success mm -hmm. when you're managing money at that level. No, no, and, and you hit on it, Paul. So I've, I've been teaching sustainable finance at Marquette University since 2009. Uh, and it's so think about the year that I started, it was 2009. It was right after the end of, uh, the, the, the GFC. Uh, and I decided when I, when I first took over that course, that the very first unit I would teach my, uh, uh AIM students who are students that are, uh, preparing for a career in, in the, in our business, uh, applied investment management students. 
And uh, we study a history of financial crises. And uh, the reason why it's an important responsible investing issue is because it, it really imbues the whole ethics of, of investing. And what, what happens under duress and in times of turbulence and you know, decisions that are made and so uh, I couldn't agree with you more. That's one of the book, you, the book you mentioned is, is one of several that are on, on that book list. And uh, that, it, it always makes for a good, rich discussion on that topic. That's a great segue into number four, which is being disciplined. And, and Paul, you tell a, a great, very powerful story about 2008 that made bear repeating here, just in terms of how, uh, when you were at the, uh, uh, chairing the, the, the Diocese of Arlington, I see that, that you, you, you held steady in the in the course. Well, yeah, I think, and 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 it's it's this is really an, an ultimate test of the of committee process and a fiduciary process because, um, you know, we all remember how topsy turvy those times were. But if you if you have a a collection of assets that are so critically important to the functioning of a major Catholic diocese, and you see them fall by 50% fairly precipitously. Uh, and your bishop looks to you and says, well, what should we do? Um, that, that puts a committee and its chair, I think, really on the spot. Um, and what you have to have is the intestinal fortitude, I guess, to honestly assess the job you've done to that point, um, diversifying assets, selecting good managers, controlling costs, um, doing everything you can to sort of button up for a storm, uh, but then realizing, frankly, that if we sell now, you will never know when to get back into the market. And mm -hmm. so simply say, well, what's the right thing to do? In my experience, Chris, in this world, um, very often the right thing for a fiduciary to do is nothing if they've gotten the process and the structure right in advance. Would you agree? I, I would uh, completely agree. I, I, I love, uh, it's in the book, that Warren Buffett's dictum that, uh, you know, our, our investment process success, we uh, attribute to our uh, benign negle neglect. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes not doing anything is much better than, than doing anything. And, and it, it goes against our very nature, right? Because uh, when we're feeling emotions in, during turbulent times, uh, we want to act more than anything, all of us. Uh, you know, when we were sitting at the bottom uh, March 23rd last year, uh, that didn't feel very good for any of us in the business. And as much as we knew that the, the, this, this period would end and there would be brighter days ahead, uh, it's very hard when you're in the middle of that. So, um, And in particular yeah, for a church organization like the ones that CIS serves, you know, it's important to focus on the fact that the investment horizon is almost an infinite horizon. It's, it's till the crack of doom, the second coming of the Lord. Um, mm -hmm. You have a very, very long-term perspective on your investments. Um, you're not trying to make a quick hit, which is the shiny object issue. Uh, and because of a long-term performance of markets, you don't have to do something precipitous today. You can have confidence that over time, it's going to work out well enough. In particular, if you stayed in the market in 2008, it worked out extraordinarily, extraordinarily well, as you, as you well know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's worth mentioning, uh, you know, the data that we reviewed at the, the front of this presentation, our, our data set from that initial study included the 2008 year. Uh, so that made what your description of board in the moment, board decisions coming out of the global financial crisis, crisis uh, we had an, a unique opportunity. We, of course, didn't plan this to see how boards had performed during that period. Uh, under great duress. And, uh, you know, as we like to say in academia, that, that increased the power of our test uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the analysis and the findings. So, um, yeah, it, it really, is, really is something when you think about that period. And then, of course, last year, and uh, that's the title of our presentation today is, you know, governance at the time of COVID. Um, you know, it, it all, all really kind of, kind of comes together on this. Tom, do we have a few more minutes for questions on this slide? I think we do. I think we do. So I'm interested, um, uh, Chris, in your views, what your, your research suggests in terms of rotation of board uh, membership, board leadership, committee leadership, and consulting relationships. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, so, you know, how much 
how much should we bring new blood into this organization is really what your question gets down to. And the, the answer is going to sound a little bit like Goldilocks and the three bears, not too much and not too little. And what we find, what we find is it's a balancing act that organizations are uh, trying to uh, find. And that is having enough continuity uh, and balance to have that carryover of institutional knowledge. And that was something I mentioned at the outset. With respect to not having organizations atrophy or become complacent or entrenched uh, so, that they, so that they are not able to respond to the, the dynamics of their environment. So it really is a, a balancing act. And that's something that was proven out in the data. Um, so if you look at board turnover, for example, uh, you, you wanted to see something uh, not too high and not too low. And, and what, what's interesting is what you, what you find is that looking at fourth and fifth quintiles for this type of thing is one of them was either way too much or way too little. And uh, usually it was the, the fourth that was the turnover weight was way too high. And, and the fifth was there was just no movement. And, and so I, I think that, that I know, I know the data bore that out. And the, the, the same was true with, with the board chair, you know, and the leadership. Typically you don't wanna see uh, board chairs turning over more than, more than every two years. Uh, and with respect to the investment consultant, you, 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 know, you, you wanna keep them around for, for a while. You don't wanna be changing them out every year, uh, but you, you know, beyond 10 years, it starts to become, you know, maybe, maybe we should look at that too. So, you know, that's, that's part of going to that, you know, sort of RFP every so often, um, you know, looking at uh, uh, who your providers are, so. Yeah, there are risks in entrenchment, aren't there? You can begin to get complacent or presumptuous. Um, uh, it all seems very routine and you're not necessarily on the balls of your feet the way you need to be. Let's, uh, let's talk about cost for a minute. Uh, and then we'll have Zayla come up and, and see if we've got any audience questions that, that uh, we, can, we can discuss. But uh, so our, our, our founding chair and great friend of, of, of uh, Paul's and mine, Jack Brennan, uh, is the former CEO of Vanguard. And obviously Vanguard's been a, a champion of low cost investing, particularly for individuals. And uh, so, you know, clearly focus on cost is important, but as Jack says, it's, it's not what you pay, it's what you bring home. So. You know, we always we always uh, focus on on performance net of fees because we think that's the relevant that, that's the relevant metric. But I'd be interested in both of your thoughts on that. Paul, well, you want to go first, or you want me to sure. stop? I will tell you one of the frustrations I've had over the years uh, with separate managed accounts is that their investment managers tend to quote their performance gross of fees. And I've had these discussions over and over again. Um, for an investment committee particularly, you need to know what your fees are, but you always need to be looking almost exclusively at what your returns are, net of fees. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's a crucial bit of data for understanding how your portfolio is doing. Yeah, and, and we, we approach it the same way uh, here at Baird. We, we focus on uh, net of fee performance uh, so, and, and recognize the role of cost control, uh, absolutely. Um, it, this was an interesting uh, aspect of our investigation, and uh, especially with the rise of passive in the last decade. And um, we, we incorporated in, in the governance modeling we did because we had the data. We, we knew what organizations were paying in annual investment expenses. And we wanted to understand, you know, how much of that figured into the, um, the, the governance um, model or metrics and how much did that influence the investment return. And it, we found a couple of things. And I, I think you hit on it about not being too focused on the number and focusing more on the return. And that I suspect has gotten a bit lost uh, in the, this whole discussion of active versus passive in, in recent years. And to some extent, it's been a, a race to the bottom. And uh, I've even gone so far as to, I, I, I write articles occasionally for uh, the CFA Inter Enterprising Investor. And uh, when, we, when we did this bit of research, I, I did write an article about it suggesting that maybe we had uh, used our, our focus on investment expense to, as a bit of a proxy for our governance 
Like we, we cut our costs this year, we're good. Um, and, and so the problem is, number one, in our research, it had no statistical bearing on the outcome, none. And uh, so, so the first problem we had is we, we couldn't find a, a statistical impact. And number two, when we did a, when we did a sort on our, uh, on our constituents, our, on our sample set, we looked at the top five and we compared them to the bottom five. And uh, we have, I have a chart on this, but we, we didn't have room for it today. And what we found is sure enough, the bottom five had cut their costs by 25% relative to the top five. Now, here's the kicker. They also gave up 80% of the return. So this, this focus on it, you know, the old saying of being uh, penny smart and pound foolish, I think definitely plays out in this. And so, whereas I do think that there is a role, especially in very efficient areas of the market, uh, as, as we talk about, as we espouse, we, we take a hybrid approach on this whole matter. Uh, yes, if you, can't, if you can't beat or you can't find a manager who can beat, and the probability is very low, and you've got very efficient markets, then you should index, and you should do it as cost-effectively as, as humanly possible. But there are other areas of the market that, and this all com comes down to your views on market efficiency, and that's probably for another day, but there are other areas of the market that are very inefficient, and that's where it takes skill. And being able to, to, being able to get that skill, you have to pay something for it, and that's, that's where this whole aspect of um, paying for active uh, I, I do think uh, has a role, and that's that's borne out in our studies and data. All right, well, Zayla, why don't we've got a, we've got some interesting questions from the audience. Why don't you take over? Great, thank you. Great questions that are coming in. So, uh, Chris, first off, could you please confirm because that question has been asked twice now that that initial slide we showed with the performance are net of fees. Uh, that that performance, yes, those those, those are net of fee numbers. That's what I thought, but I just, I think people wanted to hear that. Um, here's one great question. Can you speak more to board representation, meaning how it reflects the community that it's being served? And Paul, maybe this, this one is for you. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure Chris's research Chris too, yeah. has relevance here as well. I mean, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, in, the, in a, my experience in uh, church organizations, um, the board represents um, a finance council, whatever it might be, both lay and and uh, consecrated religious. Um, uh, and among the lay people, a variety of, of different backgrounds, uh, men and women, um, um, uh, persons of color, um, you know, those all those considerations enter into the board composition. But typically they would be pulled from, um, in this case, a uh, the, the the Catholic population that is associated with the with the the work of of the organization, whether it's the diocese or uh, a religious order or, or university or something of that sort. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, add a, a comment or two to that, uh, and certainly echo it. And one one of the nice things about once you start collecting data on any on any subject is you can start expanding uh, your 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 investigations. And so one thing that was difficult for us during our research phase was to determine the, uh, we, whereas it was easy enough for us to, well, I, I, let, me, let me correct myself. It was not easy. We could not identify based on a name, the gender or the, the race of any, of any one individual. So we knew diversity was an important aspect, but we, we didn't have a real easy way of getting to it. Since that time, with the FEQ system now out there, you know, we've been collecting data for five years uh, from organizations, we've been able to attach questions. Uh, and so among those questions we've been able to attach are diversity st uh, statistics. And so we can now tell you from our database what uh, among the top performing organizations, where they stand relative to diversity on gender and on uh, racial lines. And what I can tell you is that the best performers, and this is from the data, of uh, uh, diverse boards, greater than 25% of them are women and greater than 15% are, have people of color on their boards. So, I, I, and by that, I mean 25% of the, greater than 25% of their boards and greater than 15% of their boards. So uh, that's something that we've been able to identify and it's borne out in the research. So that's been, that's been very exciting as far as what we've been able to further, further expand on. 
And there's going to be a lot more data in this regard that's going to be becoming public with uh, uh, disclosure mandates by the SEC being considered now, voluntary reporting, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So I think there'll be a lot more transparency in this regard uh, um, in, in months and years to come, Chris. We have a um, couple of great questions, but this one is about um, environmental social governance. Chris, I know we had a couple of slides on this, but it, Sister Royal is, is asking, has your research looked at ESG issues, especially with regard to international equities, such as the effects of the Uyghurs in China? Many investors seem to be pushing to invest in various entities in China. Yeah, um, so the the issue of looking at uh, what what's good or bad in ESG is is beyond the scope of what our project has has focused on. But um, you know, I I also teach in this area and I, I stay up and current on, on on the topics. And while I can't specifically comment on that issue, um, it, it's no doubt that China is being picked up in the ratings. And so you are seeing the scores impacted, especially from ratings companies like ISS. Um, so, you know, whatever your views on China might be, it's definitely appearing in the, in the ESG ratings and, and affecting those scoring. Um, and so, you know, it, it, again, this comes down to one of the challenges in ESG investing is you really have to make decision on values and uh, understand how to express those values in relation to um, potential financial outcomes and you know, it's a tough it's a tough choice on China because China is such a large component of the of the global economy. Um, you know, how do you how do you how do you make choices on, on that basis and still and still participate? So I think it's a, a, a very, very, a very tricky question, a very one hard one to answer that uh, your, your audience members just posed. Tom, we're close to the hour mark. Um, we have a couple more questions, but I'll leave it up to you. Well, let's let's uh, see if we can answer the questions. If it was. One more question that I feel like we should, we should try to answer, and this is for you, Chris. Can you explain how the metrics led you to your observations? How did the metrics lead you to conclude weak oversight or focused on the wrong things? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that last bit? Weak over what? Weak oversight or focused? Oh, weak oversight. On, weak oversight or focused on the wrong issues. Yeah, so that that earlier uh, sidebar with those comments are, are are collections of observations from a number of surveys that have been done in the last uh, couple of years on government. You'll see organizations put out governance surveys almost every year, uh, and so uh, there was a big one done by uh, asset owners globally, State Street, a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, th th these are some of the findings and feedback that you find from uh, these, these sort of ongoing governance surveys. And that was one, one comment in there. Well, Paul, Chris, thank you so much. A very, very valuable program and lots of, lots of uh, information we didn't have a chance to cover, but hopefully uh, we're going to take the summer off from webinars, but we'll be back in the fall and, and hopefully we'll be able to work on some of these things that we weren't and able Tom, to. I, I think that Chris had some additional work that he's involved in now that he wanted to at least mention to the audience. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, th thanks so much, Paul. Um, so we are uh, thrilled to be partnering. Uh, we, we did uh, work with them last year as well, Common Fund Institute, who uh, is very well known. I think they're attending the call today as well. Um, so shout out to them. Uh, they uh, have been working with us throughout the year and uh, starting last year on governance in higher education. We're, we're conducting right now uh, the largest, to, to, my, to my knowledge, uh, study in governance in higher ed, and uh, we're using it with the FEQ and GSEC system. So um, we're still uh, taking uh, respondents to that study. And so if anyone on the call today is uh, involved in higher education, uh, we'd love to talk to you. You'd be welcome to reach out to us. Uh, and my contact is there as well as uh, Allison Kaspersky from Common Fund Institute. So we, we welcome you. Great. And Zayla will be sharing these slides after the, after the program. So again, thanks to our, our panelists uh, and thanks, special thanks to our audience for uh, joining us today. Uh, Zayla is going to have a, a quick survey after the uh, program. So please take time to fill it out. It's very helpful to us. Get your feedback. And I hope that you, you all are uh, uh, healthy and uh, safe and have a wonderful summer.
Thanks Thank again, you. Tom. Thank you, Chris. Most enjoyable. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye.